지금 바로 시작하면 되나요? 네. Hey everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the guest lecture of the 15th annual conference on Asian Pacific financial markets from the Korean Securities Association. My name is Hong Ki Sol and I'm at the Chungang University. And I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, Lilian Ng. Lilian is currently a professor of finance and Scotia chair in international finance at York University. She has received a PhD in finance from Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Before joining York University, she was a professor at various institutions, including the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and UT Austin. She was also a visiting professor at MIT, USC, and UC Irvine. To name one of the few numerous honors and recognitions, she was an editorial review board member of the Journal of International Business Studies and associate editor and guest editor for AJFF. She has also won numerous best paper awards from various institutions, including AJFF, CAFM, and FMA. And last year, she was the recipient of the Moskowitz Prize from Berkeley's Institute for Business and Social Impact. The title of her guest lecture is International Markets Integration, a Survey. As a renowned researcher, she would like to enlighten us in this field. And now it would be a lot more interesting to hear about it from herself. So let's give a warm welcome to our guest lecture speaker, Lillian. Hello, everybody. I, good afternoon to all who are tuning in to this special lecture on International Market Integration a Survey. I want to thank, um, first thank the organizers, especially Professor Kwang Wu Park, for giving me this opportunity to present a lecture at the conference. It is so unfortunate fortunate that because of the pandemic, uh, that I won't be able to be so to present this lecture in person. But then, thankfully, we have Zoom. And even though I'm in, the North, in North America, I'm still able to give this lecture at the conference. This is a 45 minute pre-recorded lecture, but there will be 15 minutes up to the end of the lecture that I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, let, let's begin. So what I'm gonna talk about mainly is on international market integration, a survey. Um, it is a survey that uh, Amir Akberry and I conducted. All right, so financial deregulation and liberalization in developed countries have gained momentum since capital controls were removed in early, 1990, in early 1980s, all right? And the, the emerging economies have started their process in the late 1980s and the, and the 1990s. And this has spurred a uh, vast literature examining the financial and economic ramifications of financial deregulation and globalization. All right, so what this survey will focus on, um, let me just um, briefly give you an outline. We focus on the theoretical and empirical research on one aspect of market integration. We know that there are many survey papers out there and they, most of them are conducted in the um, much earlier than this one, obviously. And they, they, the market integration surveys encompass many different aspects of the literature. So here, what we're gonna do is mainly to talk about equity market integration. I will first review the various approaches employed in studying market integration. And I will mainly emphasize recent empirical findings on cross-sectional and time series dynamics of in integration across developed and emerging markets. 
And then I'll describe the empirical dis estimation of three current measures of market, market integration and describe their usefulness as well as their limitations. Okay. So in, when we talk about international asset pricing research, uh, we can easily classify them into three broad categories. Uh, when you talk about asset pricing, we have it in the segmented markets, or in, on the other extreme, the integrated markets, or in between is just the partially segmented markets. So what I'm gonna do is to start talking about the segmented markets first, and then how the tests been done in the segmented markets, and then we move on to integrated and then partially segmented markets. So due to market imperfections caused by regulatory constraints, institutional practices, and investor perceptions, segment markets are segmented. And what are the various market imperfections? Let me just give you a few examples. Uh, information barriers that give rise to asymmetric information between domestic and foreign investors. There's typically the lack of transparency, and that's the reason why markets are segmented from the world market. High transaction costs is another market imperfection, foreign exchange and political risks, as well as the corporate governance differences, finally, the regulatory barriers. All these factors contribute to the, the, the driving forces for the markets to be segmented from the world markets. Now, what are the various tests of segmented markets? In the 60s and the seven, early 70s, when we test the capital asset pricing model of Sharp, Linear, and Black, we typically use a one country's data. So we use the US, for example. When we use the US as a country to test a asset pricing model, we implicitly assume that the US market is submitted from the world markets. So if I were to um, just use an example, um, the familiar local market cap, and I use the word local here. So here we have the expected return of asset J in country K, which is explained by the risk-free rate of country K. And then the beta, beta J here is the exposure of asset J to the local market risk in country K. And this Expectation of R's of K is the return on the market portfolio in country K. So this is the familiar cap end that we have been teaching to our students. And in the 60s and the 70s, this is the model that many of us use to test the asset pricing model. So given that there is no global factor here, we implicitly assume that this model tests the segmented market. Now, when we have this assumption, then the question is whether it is a reasonable working assumption, yes. But this assumption is only true all the way through 1970s when the markets are pretty much closed. But since the 1980s, when more developed markets have removed their capital controls and become more liberalized, right? Um, that means this is not really a good working assumption to use in this, in this um, error. Okay, so now we move to the other extreme, which is the integrated markets. When markets are fully integrated, what does that mean? It means that there exists a unique global pricing kernel or stochastic discount factor that governs asset prices across the world, independent of where the location is, independent of the base currency that you use. So the research work, seminar papers, as, as a matter of fact, very widely cited papers uh, by Sonic 1974, Stokes 81, Adler and Duma, their survey paper in 1983. So if markets are fully integrated, we expect that assets with the same risk must have identical expected returns, irrespective of the market, where the market is, it doesn't really matter. And the risk refers to exposure to the world, world factors, obviously. So for example, hypothetically, we assume that there is an asset J in Canada. And the asset J has the risk exposure to the common world factor. Let's assume there's only one common world factor. And the, the risk is assumed 0.8. Then the expected return on asset J in Canada 
will be 12%, hypothetically, all right? So let's assume that there is another asset, say A, in Korea, in Seoul, and it has the same level of risk exposure to the, to the world market factor, and which is 0.8. If indeed asset A has the same level of risk with the world market factor, that means the expected return of asset A in Seoul has to be priced similarly to asset J in Canada. So that means both of them have to be equal in terms of the level of expected returns. So this is what it means by integrated markets. The markets are fully integrated. So Chen and Kanes in the 1995 kind of described this whole concept of market integration very nicely, that it is an implication that the law of one price has to hold. All right. So what, is mean, what, what does it mean when, when we are in the integrated markets? How would the price of an asset be, be uh, char char characterized here? So here we have this equation one, we have the PJ as a J in country K at time T. It's described by the expectation of the covariance between the stochastic discount factor M of the global discount factor and the expected, I mean, sorry, the cash flows, future cash flows X um, in country K of um, S at J. Now, if I were to put this in a, a, a testable form, you will see that this is the global cap n, where on the right hand side now you see the expected return on the global market factor as opposed to the earlier on we have the country market factor here. So as a j here, the beta j will be exposure to the global market risk. So this is what we meant by the um, how the pricing of the assets in the integrated market. Now let me just go over some of the you know, examples of price studies that assume different sources of risk, but in the integrated markets. So we have the World Cap N uh, by Harvey 1991 and the references there. Uh, you see Duma and Sonning and Duma have a, a paper on the World Cap N with exchange risk. It is a theoretical paper. And then we have the World Consumption Based Model by Weekly 1988. We have the World APT by Sonic 83. Cho Yun and Sambat, 86. We also have the World multi beta uh, Models by Ferson and Harvey in 1993 paper. And we also have the World Latent Factor Models by Campbell Hamel, 1992, Baycard and Hodrick, 1992, and Harvey, Sonic and Zos in 1994. Uh, one important point I'd like to raise is that when any rejection of these models should be interpreted with, a, uh, with some uh, level of caution. It is also, a, it can be viewed as a rejection of the fundamental as a pricing model, or it can, be as, it can be viewed as a rejection of a market efficiency or market integration. So the bottom line, what I'm saying is that it is all, all these are mainly a joint test in asset pricing. All right, now let's go on to the next uh, type of markets, which is the partially segmented markets. Here what we have is asset prices are explained by both global and local factors. So if the markets are more integrated, then their asset returns will be explained more by global cap N than by local cap N. So for more segmented markets, the asset returns will be explained more by local cap N than by local then by global cap and I think this is very intuitive. I mean, you know, um, th there are two factors. If the if one factor is more influential than the other factor, then you can say whether the asset returns are explained by one over the other. So uh, Arunza and Loss in the 1985 and 1989 papers kind of give you a very nice model to describe these two factors. So expected returns are assets in any country are determined by the exposure to both the global risk factor and the local market risk factor here. Um, I'm trying to get my key here coming in. So, so what we have is the expected return of our JK is described by the risk-free rate. And then we have the covariance of RJ, the asset J in country K with the global risk factor, global market factor, which is 
RG. And then we have the gamma here, which will be the description of the global uh, covariance between RJ and, um, let me just go back, sorry, RJ and the R sub K, which is the local market return conditional on the portfolio return of globally accessible local assets. So here, gamma here is the price of the local market risk and lambda, obviously, the price of the global market risk. So this is what we have in mind, the partially um, segmented markets. All right. So what is another um, methodology? This is one by Baycott and Harvey. They develop a time varying integration measure where the expected return of K, country K's market portfolio is determined by its covariation with the global market portfolio and by the variance of the market portfolio returns itself here. So we have the usual, it's very similar to a runser and loss. The only difference is that we have this fee here and we have the variance as opposed to the covariance of the asset return with the market portfolio the local market portfolio. Now, fee K falls in the range of zero to one and can be interpreted as the time varying assessment of the likelihood that the market K is integrated. So in Bacon and Harvey's um, paper, what they, they claim is that in the perfectly integrated market, only the covariance matters. If only the covariance matters, meaning that the local market variance is not important, then the fees of K must be equal to one, which is very intuitive. That in the segmented markets, the variance of R to K, which is the local market variance, is the only re relevant measure of market risk, then the fees of K have to be zero. So when fee of K is zero, this, this particular term falls out of the model. And what we are left with is the variance of the market variance of the local market. So, in this particular methodology, what methodology that um, Baker and Harvey use is the Markov switching regime approach to estimate the fee here in this particular model. All right, so the next um, approach that is developed by Carreri, Arunza, and Hogan, and Carreri, Chap, and Arunza in 2013, they introduced what you call an integration index. So what an integration index? Integration index is, um, what they have is, is defined as one minus the variance of the local market portfolio return, conditional on the portfolio return of the globally accessible local assets, R sub E. And then it is um, the, the denominator here is the variance of, is the country's case market variance. So when you look at this model, you immediately you, you will see that the II index, the, the integration index II has to lie between zero and one range. Where one is a full market integration for country K, and then zero will be country K is fully segmented from the world market. Now, the II is empirically similar to the R square or the regression of RK and RE. So it is a, it's just, just like the R square. The difference here is that the, the authors use an arch and gauge here. I, I have it, uh, it's just been, you can see here, it is they use a gauge process to estimate the II, the model here, which is very different from the OLS, obviously. All right. So, after describing all this methodology, uh, what I'm going to do is to sort of give you a summary of the existing empirical evidence before I describe the three more current methodologies or two very popularly used methodology in addition to the methodology that my co-authors and I uh, developed in our JFQA paper. So here, most countries, um, so the first thing that uh, existing empirical evidence has found is that most countries as a bit increased by varying um, levels of um, uh, financial integration. So the global integration has not increased uniformly because of the presence of implicit barriers as uh, shown in Carreri, Chap, and Arunza's 2013 paper. Uh, as you recall, we I talk about implicit barriers. They include the institutional environments, information barriers, as well as the regulatory barriers. 
Then Carreri, Eronzo, and Hogan has another paper in 2007, the, their prize paper in GFQA. They found that the evolution of financial market integration actually at times they reverse in emerging markets. And they were looking at a period between 1977 and 2000, all right? So this evidence is also shown in uh, Juan Ton and Rose in their 2009 GFE paper and Eileen and Gerard's paper in their 2015 review of finance paper. They find similar evidence as Carreri, Eronza and Hogan, except that several EMG emerging markets move toward lower financial integration. So, um, so this is some of the evidence that uh, I've been shown. And then Baker, Harvey, Lumblet, and Siegel in their 2011 and 2013 paper show that many European countries experience reduced levels of segmentation, which means that European markets have been integrated, especially after the introduction of a euro currency. But emerging markets, as they have found, are still heavily segmented. All right. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is after describing what the existing studies have uh, found and the existing methodologies, what I'm gonna to describe to you will be the more current measures of market integration. All right, there are two commonly cited measures of international market integration. Um, one by Put Juan Tons and Rose, uh, their JFE 2009 paper is called the R square measure. To make it simple for myself, I'm going to use the word PR. PR referring to put one ton and row. And then the other very popularly used measure is by Baycott, Heavy, Lumblet, and Siegel's 2011 earnings use differentials. All right. So these are the two very commonly uh, adopted measures. And then I'm going to introduce my own measure, obviously. Um, I, we have. Uh, I have a paper with a Barry and Sonny in 2020 GFQA just came out in the December issue where I'm going to use the word ANS, where we develop measure of time varying market integration. So here we use a arch and gauge processes. Uh, we, it is a, what you call the smooth transition dynamic conditional correlation approach where we, we take the correlation between the uh, measures of uh, integration to have as a proxy for the measure of market integration. I'm going to describe to you in a second. And then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you a visual comparison of the behavior of these three metrics using the same sample. Uh, what we have is a 21 developed markets and 20 emerging markets during the sample period between 1989 to 2015. So in this way, when I make the visual comparison of the three different metrics of market integration, you'll be able to see the advantages and disadvantages of one approach over the other approach. And I hope that this will be helpful to you, okay? Now let's start off with the PR uh, measure. So the PR measure, it, they propose an R square as a measure of global equity market integration. So the country's degree of equity market integration will fall between uh, zero, which is completely cemented, and one will be completely integrated. So what they have done is that they use a, the R square estimate, um, the R square estimate is obtained by regressing country portfolio returns on latent global asset pricing factors, all right? So it is a two-step procedure, and the two-step procedure is that the global SDF is numerically proxied by 10 asset pricing factors that are abstracted using a principal component analysis from daily, as you, I like to emphasize, daily country index returns of 17 mostly developed countries. And they claim that these countries have the largest economies um, in the world and have the largest, longest tradition of free uh, capital mobility. So the premise is that for more globally integrated economies, uh, variations of their country equity returns are better explained by the global SDF, which is empirically proxy by the latent factors. So it is not surprising that this country index returns are indicative of the global SDF. So the measure of global equity integration for country uh, K in guillotine is the adjusted R square of the following regression. So here, 
the F here, there are 10 factors. So F will be I, F I, I takes one to 10, and they are principal component factors. All right. So as I said that we will, I mean, uh, in my survey paper with Amir, we estimate the PR's R square measure. We estimate the R square using at least 50 daily uh, observations. We did exactly what they have done. And then we conduct the analysis using 41 countries for the period 1989 to 2015. All right. So this is the first graph that you're going to look. So what we have done here is that we, we use that methodology to, to, uh, to, to estimate the market equity market integration for the developed countries, excuse me, the developed countries are the, the graph is in bold here. And then this is the emerging markets, which is dash lines. As you can see, it is clearly obvious, right? that the developed markets are more financially integrated with the world market than the emerging markets. So, they, so this is one obvious um, that we are not surprised. And the other thing that is obvious in this graph is that there is an increasing trend on market integration after the 1999, it goes deep here and it's been coming up all the way. And then after 2010, it dropped and then it went back up again. So this gives you um, uh, and, uh, the, the um, graphs of the PR market integration. Let's move on to the next, the second popular measure, not second in terms of order, but second, I mean, in terms of popularity, but second in terms of the order that I'm presenting it. So the second one is the Baker, Harvey, Lumbert and Seeger's 2011 SEG index. They call it the SEG, SEG index, which is segmentation index. So the, the BHLS segmentation measure, it introduced a model-free measure of market segmentation, all right? So the SEG is not directly extracted from any of the asset pricing model that we described earlier, that I described earlier on. Uh, it is based on the price earnings ratio differentials of industry portfolios across the markets. So under the now of economic, and financial integration, industry portfolios must have similar growth opportunities and have similar uh, systematic risk across markets. So their PE ratios should be similar. So this is their, the premise of their argument. So they calculate SEG for country K and bond T is calculated by this, where IW here is the weight of industry J in country K. So they are, this, they are calculating the deviations of country case industry earnings yield from the global um, market earnings yields for that particular industry and they sum it across all the industries of the country to determine the level of segmentation. Okay, so let me just point out a few things um, just to make sure that we are on this, you know, we are following what I'm trying to say here. There are certain points that we need to note about the SEG index. E here, the earnings yield, which is actually a PE ratio, earnings yield is E over price. E is not forward-looking earnings, but it is based on past year reported earnings. All right? So the P is the current stock price and reflects expectations about future cash flows. What the numerator E is based on the trailing realized cash flows published in the past 12 months. So with sticky trailing earnings, if earnings do not revi revise uh, uh, through time, then the short-term changes in earnings use will be mostly coming from P. So I'd like you to sort of bear that in mind, the shortcoming of this particular approach, and you're going to see that in the graph later on. So SEG, SEG, SEG index is just a value-weighted average of the absolute differences between the earnings use across industries. All right, so this is the graph that I'm going to show you. As you can see that this is the segmentation uh, that they have calculated. This is the developed markets here. They're on top. The top dot dash ones are the emerging markets. The bold ones are the um, emerging, um, the, sorry, the developed markets. So here, as you can see that the difference between this particular measure and PR measure is that when there are crises, the segmentation increase. But recall that in the PR model, in the PR graphs, when there are crises, the markets become more, more integrated. But in 
BHL and the markets become more segmented. So uh, the way we argue is that because they are, the measurement is determined by the inverse of PE ratio. So when the market drop, it could be caused by the drastic worsening of the economic outlook or the drastic revision or in terms of the risk aversion, increase in risk aversion or both. So when you have trailing earnings that will remain approximately the same, all right? So in that case, then the earnings price ratio will be pretty much caused by the price that is falling and earnings remain the same. So this is the argument that we are giving why you see what you're saying, why you're saying this increase in segmentation um, during the crisis period. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is um, actually my own uh, paper, obviously. Here what we have is um, um, the arguments that my paper make with my co-authors in the JFQA paper that we started off with asking the question is that why there is little information about the nature of globalized integration across world markets, despite the increase in globalization. So the two common questions, I, I, I kind of like these two questions. I hope you like to share the same. Why is China, the second largest economy in the world, identified as less integrated into the global market? On the other hand, Ireland, which contributes little to global economic growth, but it is identified as highly integrated with the world markets. Given these questions, one wonder why? Why have large international trade and high interconnect interconnection of firms not resulted in integration of emerging markets? As we all know that emerging markets exports have gone up. They are highly, um, they are very global in terms of their exports to other countries, but why are they not integrated with the world market? So, the argument is that if international trade, if you have international trade, there will be high core movement of cash flows, uh, but this is not market integration in general, it is real economic integration rather than the widely studied, studied financial integration. So in this study, what we have argued is that there are two types of economic, there are two types of integration that we should not pretty much mess them up by just using one integration measure. We look at economic integration, which is a state where economic shocks are strongly correlated across countries. And the other measure of integration will be financial integration, where a state where the, a state where the same risks are priced the same across markets. All right. So in ANS, what they have done is they introduced what you call the time varying integration measures. They disentangled the economic and financial integration in a theoretically motivated setting. So they proposed new measures of market integration based on cash flow and discount rate news decomposition. So what I'm going to do next is to also uh, to give you an, uh, a sense of their models and how it works. So the financial integration will be defined as a common risk pricing dynamic and the economic integration will be defined as a common cash flow dynamic. So here we use a forward looking firm level analyst earnings forecast about 40,000 companies. Bear in mind that we are using forward looking as opposed to BHLS is using past earnings or trailing earnings. And we differentiate between developed and emerging markets. All right, so we study that using the STDCC that will capture the long and short dynamics of market integration and it also controls for volatility bias. Um, let me just give you a, a insight into how the models are being developed here. In integrated markets, right, we have one stoch unique stochastic discount factor M, uh, prices every security. So we have this pricing equation that I mentioned earlier on. So what, what ANS have done is to start out with this equation and then they expand it to, into two parts. Here we have the, the expectation of the uh, dividends here at T plus J and you discount it by the risk-free, the term structure interest rate. And the second term is the covariance of the stochastic discount factor with the cash flow. So in this particular specification, there are two components here. This is the present value component 
and this is a risk pricing adjustment component. So the present value is solely driven by the economic fundamentals of the firm. So that's how they argue that, um, that the price itself are, consists of two parts, the pricing part and the cash flows part, which is the real activity. Now they estimate firm level present value using discounted future expected earnings forecast as here. Uh, this is how they compute the cash flows here. And, and they use the term structure of interest rates as a discount factor. All right, so then you ask, how do we calculate the RA, which is the risk pricing adjustment where uh, the RA will be the price minus the, the cash flows of new. So that means this is the residual effect on that. Okay, so one, I just want to describe to you some of the advantages of ANS return decomposition approach over traditional methods like Campbell and Schiller, uh, 1988. Uh, one is that they employ firm level forward looking analyst forecasts, all right, to extract the cash flow and the risk pricing adjustments. And these are timely of reflections of investors' cash flows expectations. Um, they do not resort to predictive reg regressions as in Campbell and Schiller, and they do not even require any country level state um, variables. So this is another problem associated with the earlier present value technique, where you need a proxy for what the uh, variables that one will use as state variables in their estimation. And they do not even require any long term, long term, um, I mean, long time series of data to estimate the cash flow and the, I mean, actually this is our rate, I mean, the cash flow and the risk pricing adjustment. All right, so what they do here is, I'm gonna go through very quickly since uh, I'll refer to the paper if you're interested in this model. So what they assume is that the cash flow of country K and the cash flow of global market follow an AR process with the residuals Denoted, denoted by UK and UG respectively. So then they define, this is pretty much the standard gauge process where you have the HT, which is the conditional covariance matrix and the VT, which is the standardized error term. Uh, it's distributed normal IID with uh, mean zero and standard deviation one. Uh, so the HT is DT times C times DT. Here DT is a diagonal of the standard deviation. So, when, so you have these various covariance metrics. So they assume that the conditional variance of each cash flows assumes a gauge one one process and CT is a time varying conditional correlation. So that's how they estimate the time varying economic and financial uh, integration. All right, so they assume that the CT is a bivariate normality and these are the, I will not go into all these um, technical uh, jargons, but I'll refer you, to, refer you to read the paper if you're interested in it. Okay, so the estimate CT of CF and C, CFK and CFG. So the fee here, I mean, sorry, this is a Q bar, is the unconditional correlation matrix of the standardized error. So this is pretty much the procedure they use. They use the, maximum livelihood estimate to get the, the CT that we are interested in. And they repeat the same procedure when estimating CT of hours of uh, the risk adjustment, the risk pricing adjustment of country K and our global factor. With that, let me describe the plot. So if you see the plots here, and you can see that it is, uh, this is the, um, the developed markets, and this is the emerging markets, this is only on financial integration here. Again, you see that the developed market is, they are more integrated with the world market than the emerging markets. And the, the difference between the gap between these two integration measures are fairly stable across time. All right, let's look at the economic integration here, which I, I thought was very interesting here. If you look at the economic integration and the top is the developed market and the bottom here is the emerging markets, in the, during the stock market crash, the, the two, um, they become more integrated and then they fall. And apparently the, emer the developed markets fall more 
than the emerging markets and so much so that they converge at the end of the sample period in 2015. So this is one of the main contributions of the, um, the, the measure that we, we show that, as you can see that um, the economic integration shows that the emerging markets have become uh, more integrated with the world market. And in fact, it converged to the level of the economic integration of the developed markets, but not in, in the case of the financial markets. And I guess because um, the financial markets, yeah, even, though the, even though China is the second largest economy in the world, you can see that they, their financial system is still fairly close to the outside world. All right. Now, the important part of this survey is I'd like to show you the ask, the comparison between ANS um, integration measure and the other two measures that I just described, the PRR square and the BHLS segmentation measure. If you look at this, the differences between PR, PRs, I have it in, in the black, all right? And then the red ones are ANS. As you can see that the, the, um, the PR measures are much more volatile than the uh, ANS measure. And, and they are much more stable. And the reason is that there is a very clear volatility bias in their computation. Uh, in years of high volatility during the 1980 here, 1980, sorry, it, uh, yes, 1990, uh, during the oil shock in 1990, and 1997 is the Asian crisis. And then the, um, the 2001, you see the 2001, the dot-com bubble. And in 2008 to 2009, the global financial crisis, um, that, that are, these are peaks in their, in their specification. And if you, and the estimation shows that if I were to look, if I compute the correlation of their measure with VIX, their correlation is about 38%, which means that their measures of integration has built in uh, a substantial amount of volatility bias compared to the ANS. And the, the difference here is that the ANS has already extracted the cash flows effect from this financial integration. And you can see that this is much more, much smoother than the PRs. Next, when you look at the comparison between SAC and the, um, the ANS, I can see that the ANS uh, financial integration kind of come down. What, what they have done to, to remind you is that they calculate the um, financial integration, where else? So they take one minus the financial integration to get a segmentation measure. So it will be more comparable with the segmentation measure of BHLS. And if you can see that the BHLS is very, their, their, their trend is very volatile here. And we argue that it is mainly due to the price crashes during the crisis. And with earnings being very sticky, you see that the, the segmentation kind of spiked, spiked during this crash, crashes period. Okay, so these are, these are some of the comparisons that I have um, shown. And I hope you, you see the value of why it is important to decompose market integration into economic integration and financial integration. Now, just to wrap up, I have for like three minutes. I want to talk about the avenues for future research. All right. Okay. So what we have seen, um, such a vast literature on equity market integration, uh, there are still many unanswered questions. At this junction, I'd like to kind of elaborate some of the avenues for future research based on the framework developed in the survey. So even after being fully liberalized over the last 35 years, the question we always have is why emerging markets are still lagging behind their developed counterparts in integrating their economies into the world economy. So finance theory has already suggested that global financial integration improves capital allocation, efficiency, resharing across countries. So as emerging markets liberalize their financial markets, their economies should become more integrated into the world market thereby lowering their cost of capital and reducing the investigation benefits of foreign investors. Uh, one suggestion or one avenue that I, we would suggest is that you, one should explore the underlying forces that hinder the full market integration and equalization of the investment 
opportunity set between developed and emerging markets. The second point we're going to talk about is the institutional investors. We know institutional investors are major players in international financial markets, but there is very little research on whether and how they contribute to the integration process, um, especially in the emerging markets. Uh, theoretical models argue that as more investors hold international assets, there is greater risk sharing between domestic and foreign investors. But due mainly to a lack of data, existing information, existing studies have not been successful in establishing cha this channel. So if we want, this is one direction for future research is to explore whether and how institutional investors contribute to the pace of market uh, integration in emerging markets. So last but not least, um, with, I would like to talk about the, sorry, um, the global the global, the 2008 global financial crisis. We see that the crisis has resulted in negative, several negative consequences of market integration. There's a volatility spillover when one country is in financial crisis, it spills over to the other countries, which did not to start off with. So the contagion of financial shocks affected capital markets and the real economy of many countries. Um, that we see a new wave of micro potential policies trying to stop this or trying to reduce these adverse effects. So such actions have motivated subsequent research to evaluate the costs and benefits associated with market integration. So the question now we have is, uh, what are the costs associated with losing control? When you lose control of your country's own domestic market, when any spill over from the, another market to our market, so we should evaluate what the costs associated of being integrated with the world market. The second question is obviously, what are the direct and indirect consequences of losing the monetary policy independence when the country is, is very integrated with the world market? All right, with these are the three possible avenues for future research in this area. And I really appreciate um, you know, your time listening to my lecture. Thank you so much. And if you have any question, uh, please feel free. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful guest lecture, Lillian. Uh, so do you have any questions from the audience? So I guess we don't have any questions from the audience in the hall. Do you have any questions from any, uh, anyone from the Zoom? Okay, uh, if not, I think that concludes this guest lecture session. Thank you very much, Lillian. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope to see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, 감사합니다.